Hi. All right, everybody. So it is a privilege to welcome all of you tonight to this unique and sure to be interesting, engaging, and fascinating and artistic evening that we're calling Graphic Science Comics Engage the Cosmos. And these are not stand-up comics, okay? Do not make that mistake. And tonight we're lucky to be joined by not one, not two, not three, not four, no, four, okay, sorry. <laughs> Four fascinating scientists, physicists, and one roboticist. We won't mention, hold that against him. So the roboticist that is going to be talking is, is none other than Dr. Jorge Cham, who is a mechanical engineering expert from Stanford University and got his PhD and went on to develop a world-renowned uh, comic strip called PhD Comics, which is really quite, uh, quite unique in that it captures the thrill and the passion and the, and the happiness that it means to be a graduate student. So you guys uh, assuredly know of his, of his uh, creations. And his collaborator, uh, Professor Daniel Whiteson from UC Irvine, our campus sister to the north, is also a collaborator of Jorge's and will be joining him after um, uh, for a, uh, a joint presentation on their book, which today was released in paperback form right here. So purchasing will be take place afterwards, and I have my own ability to take cash and credit cards. No, I, I won't do that. They will take cash and credit cards. And we also have Professor Clifford Johnson from uh, UC, no, USC, so from the University of Southern California, an institution that sometimes gets confused for UC San Diego. Uh, but we are very honored to have him here. And he is out to describe his book, which is called The Dialogues, which is a fascinating work of art and science and quite unique. So all these three people have together this unique ability to communicate science. And that's perfectly apropos for our fourth scientist is none other than the physics girl. So sometimes Cliff gets mad at me when I call him one, I call him Marvel Comics Science Advisor. He likes to be called one of Marvel Comics Science Advisor. Not the advisor, but Diana likes to be called the physics girl. She's not a physics girl. And she will be uh, leading the Q&A session tonight. So she is a physics major from MIT, I believe is where you did your undergraduate work in physics. So I am Brian Keating. I'm a professor of physics at the University of California, San Diego. And I'm also associate director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. And you see Sir Arthur, which really embodies the vision that we want to uh, propose here for the modern scientist, which is to be somebody who engages with the culture as well as with the science. And no one did that better than Sir Arthur C. Clarke. Clark. So we have many different components, and I urge you to get involved with our mission on campus, which you can find at imagination.ucsd.edu. And we study things from neurology to astronomy, cognitive science, and speculative culture. And every year we run workshops on science fiction writing. We have some of the most uh, famous and prestigious uh, science, uh, science fiction authors that have come through our doors here in San Diego. And we're, we're honored that they come back every year. So I'd like to thank those who have enabled us tonight to put this presentation on between these four illustrious scientists, in particular Viasat Incorporated, one of our founding Orbit members, in fact, the, one of the original founding Orbit members for the Arthur C. Clarke Center, and also our co-sponsor, UCSD Graduate Division. All of you are here to meet the PhD comics that really capture your life and your essence of existential dread every week. So tonight we have a jam-packed schedule. We're gonna have presentations from three scientists and then we're gonna have a Q&A session afterwards. So I'm gonna stop blabbering on and then we're gonna look to the audience for question and answer and that'll be led by Diana. Uh, and we will first hear from Professor Cliff Johnson who, as I said, is, has come down and he is going to describe this very unique book uh, that I really have never seen a book like this. And so, uh, so I'm so tickled that you are here uh, tonight to join us and I can't wait to hear this presentation. Afterwards, we'll be uh, treated to a live drawing presentation by Jorge, PhD comics fame, and then Daniel will come up with Jorge. They'll describe their book, again, now available in paperback. And then afterwards, after the Q&A session, which we encourage participation from the audience, uh, and the graduate students, you are allowed to speak, okay? So we're telling you, no, we normally, no, we, we, we always allow you guys to speak. Afterwards, we'll have Q&A, and then a book signing and a reception. So enjoy the evening. and it's very generous of you to uh, ask me to come and talk about uh, the book. Um, what people are often interested in is exactly why do they do this and, and how, so I'll try and, and in the spirit of 
one particular genre uh, corner of comics, which is superhero comics, I will, I will, uh, I will uh, in that spirit, uh, tell you the origin story of the, uh, of the book. So uh, that's the book. Uh, moving on. Um, let me tell you first a little bit about the mission, which I suspect is, is shared by um, um, all three of my other colleagues, and also, of course, Brian, which is this business of, uh, in addition to doing what we do, uh, being out there in um, whatever our space is that we do our science, uh, doing our research, doing our teaching, what have you, we also think it's important to be elsewhere, which is in the rest of the world, out there getting people excited about science getting people engaging with science. Not because we want everyone else to be a scientist as well, that would not be very interesting. Uh, the real reason is because, uh, at least from my perspective, uh, we are enriched by our culture. Science really is, or at least it should be, part of our culture, and we should all be able to dip in and out of it freely, uh, just like any other part of the culture. So a lot of my work is really just trying to get uh, people out there in the world um, engaging with science just like they engage with aspects of the arts or, or politics or, or uh, anything else. And so uh, this book is uh, part, of, um, part of that mission. Uh, the actual idea for the book began um, uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, and and I'm, I'm sure you'll hear many people um, who are out there in the world explaining things, whether it be science or what have you, uh, in a reasonably successful way, people start going, so when are you going to write the book? And there's always, you know, when are you going to write the book? And the idea people have, at least for people in my field, uh, doing science, and, uh, is that you're going to, you know, eventually write a book that uh, uh, and it explains and gets people excited about some aspect of your research, and, and, and that's great. And I think those books are awesome and should continue uh, to be made. Uh, but largely speaking, I, I, I didn't feel in a hurry to do one of those books. I, I didn't feel any urgency. I felt that um, there's a lot of really good people doing these books. Uh, uh, and these books have a certain kind of uh, character to them, a certain kind of uh, way they're written, a certain tone to them, more or less. And uh, they exist in a certain part of the bookstore, and a certain kind of person who's already predisposed to engage with those ideas goes to that part of the bookstore and gets the latest, part, latest thing on, on whatever's coming out. And that's a wonderful thing, but I didn't think we're really reaching new people. And I feel uh, physics especially is supposed to be one of the very innovative fields, and I feel we've been actually spectacularly uninnovative in physics when it comes to writing books. Um, uh, that, that really uh, can, can be as broad in the ways they bring people in and the kinds of people they bring people in. So I wanted to broaden that. This isn't to bash the, what I said is the sort of more standard way of doing things. That's an important and vital cornerstone. And in fact, a lot of my book calls, you know, calls your attention to those other kinds of books. But I feel we, we, can, we can really broaden what we do. So that was the point. I put up here uh, uh, just... This is actually from a book of my own, which is a more technical book, but I, I didn't feel it was fair to put anyone else's book while I said those things up there. So, so anyway. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, still 20 years ago, that, uh, I, you know, I was thinking, and then I thought, oh, there is a kind of book that would be interesting uh, that isn't really out there. Uh, and, and that is one that, instead of being sort of the, 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 the single voice of the expert telling you about a certain kind of thing, which can be done very beautifully, Brian's book being an example, um, uh, why, not, why not peek over the shoulder of conversations? I, I, I actually spend a lot of time sitting in cafes and people watching in various places, and I'm fascinated by what people are saying, and I think, generally speaking, we all are fascinated by other people, because we're people. And, and would it be interesting to have uh, an opportunity to eavesdrop on conversations about science? I thought that'd be kind of an interesting thing. So that was the core idea. So I realized, of course, that this is actually that aspect is an ancient tradition that's in some ways been forgotten um, in a lot of the, the larger literature, which is the, 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 spirit, the, uh, the, the, the book of dialogues. And of course, we all know about Plato and the Socratic dialogues, for example. Um, and less well known is the fact that actually uh, some of the ideas that Galileo is most well known for in revolutionizing our understanding of the world um, was actually in dialogue, they, they, they in some sense were the popular books of the day in dialogue form. They weren't scientific papers, they were actually dialogues. Um, so in some ways, I was looking to resurrect that old tradition, um, uh, but instead of, you, you know, uh, 
people in togas on a mountaintop or what, what, whatever it is you think those dialogues are, um, they'd be contemporary. They'd be dialogues between people, ordinary people like us, um, uh, out there in the real world, in cafes and places like that. So that was sort of the idea, but I still didn't work on the book. It wasn't where, I, it's, so there was still something missing. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to have uh, the scribblings that you sometimes do when you're having an animated conversation in a cafe, maybe you grab a napkin and you scribble some things, and, and, and th those can be interesting. So I thought it would be interesting to represent some of those scribblings, and maybe it would be sort of a prose book with, with some illustrations of some of, some of those, those, uh, those scribblings, showing some of the beats of the conversation. So that was sort of the idea, that seemed interesting. Then I shelved it for a while, some years went by, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to see the people? That would be fun, instead of just reading what they're saying, you're also seeing who these people are. That might draw you in. That could be interesting, um, relatable, if you like, in contemporary terms. And then the next thing is, well, wouldn't it be interesting to see where the people are having the conversations? Instead of just mentioning it, uh, 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 show it. And uh, so, yeah, that would show that science is something that isn't just in the realm of the lab or the specialized conference room. It's out there in the world. So that was sort of the idea. So show it. Uh, and then I got a bit carried away, and, and, and so on and so forth. So anyway, that, that, that eventually, eventually around uh, 2006 or so, I realized, oh my goodness, the prose has been eaten by the illustrations, and this is now narrative art that I'm using to talk about the science. This isn't a prose book with some illustrations anymore. Oh, it's a graphic novel. Uh, that's what it is. And then once I realized that's what I was doing, then, uh, then I kind of dropped so, so many other projects, and thought, I have to do this. this th there's nothing out there in the world like this. It has, it has to be done at least as an experiment to see if, if, uh, if people respond to it. So let me tell you a little bit about the book, and let me tell you some of the unique things that I think are possible when you combine these media in the service of explaining um, uh, uh, quote-unquote complex ideas. So in the book, you will see conversations between people. Uh, you'll see speech bubbles. Uh, people saying things, and that's nice. Um, and uh, you'll see different kinds of people, which is also a nice thing you can show. And they're having real grown-up conversations. This isn't comedy, it isn't, it isn't, uh, it isn't um, some of the other uh, forms that you sometimes associate with this form, which are, again, great things. This, this is an attempt to really uh, engage with uh, the kind of reader who uh, might read, you know, uh, I don't know, Persepolis or some other um, graphic novel that, that, is, that, is, that is talking about some serious ideas in a narrative way. And so that was sort of the, uh, that's what you'll see, but I get to do a whole bunch of other things. One of the things that incre I find incredibly annoying in the publishing world when it comes to science books is, is the fact that we're, we're, we're told not to show equations, for example. Apparently, this scares people away, and you're not supposed to do it. And I, I absolutely detest that because equations are a crucial part of what we do and how we think about things. And it would be, you know, to, 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 to hide so much of what we do, even if you don't fully understand it, it should be there on the page. You can at least see what it looks like. Maybe you'll read some of it and get, get something out of it. And if you don't, it doesn't matter. You're not, you shouldn't be scared away by it. So, um, so I want the freedom to show some of the tools of what, uh, that, that we use. In fact, in this uh, story, not only do they show them, they actually go in and have a real conversation about why physicists think those are among the most beautiful equations ever, ever written down. And they show you why without you having any expertise in how to read equations. Because you can read equations even if, you, even if you're not a mathematician. And so I get to show that because they are visual elements that work well on the page. Um, uh, here are some other people talking, some other conversations uh, in all kinds of places. These people are on the train, so on and so forth. Let me tell you a little bit about the many different levels of what you can have going on when you're doing this kind of thing, which is unique, I think, uh, to this medium. So yes, I can, I can have uh, speech bubbles and people talking about the ideas. Um, and that would just be illustrating the prose book. 
Uh, uh, so happily, one can do a lot more than that because you can have the people actually. Oh, I have a pointer. I forgot. You can actually have the people engage with objects around them that help that then are brought in to illustrate the idea. So that's like another level beyond just showing a bunch of uh, a bunch of people talking. Uh, I can also show you, like I said, things that uh, someone might write down that, that illustrate some of the, 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 the process of doing science. So that's another level. But then I can also go abstract on the same page, and I can show you something like this. Anyone know what this is? Yeah, it's called a Feynman diagram. It is, without question, one of the most powerful tools ever invented in science. Um, uh, but it's a cartoon, right? We actually use cartoons as physicists to compute things. And uh, uh, I actually drape comic book panels around it. If you read them in the conventional way, you will actually reconstruct some of the processes that physicists use to describe how the world works. That's an awesome thing that you get to do. So that's another level, going to the abstract. I can also um, do, have things resonate on the page. These people are actually talking about uh, something you may have heard of, uh, ideas uh, from quantum physics where the universe may or may not be branching every time there are quantum choices being made. And so I resonate with that conversation uh, with, this, uh, with this visual element here. So that's sort of a nice thing you can have on the page. Uh, so that's another level. Um, I can do some other things as well. The process of doing theoretical physics, uh, in my mind, is actually well represented by the process of doing a jigsaw puzzle. And, and uh, there's, a, there's a couple of people who talk about that in the book. And actually, at one point, have the panel structure take on the form of a jigsaw puzzle and illustrate the important idea that sometimes you get stuck because sometimes the pieces don't fit. So I get to play with that as well while she's talking. So you can really resonate visually with some of the stuff that's going on in terms of the ideas and what people are saying. And that, that's really very, a, a wonderful thing that, that's uh, important about the form. Uh, and then I, I can play as well. There's one point where, where it's, uh, a, a couple of people start doing an analogy between what's called spontaneous symmetry breaking and uh, uh, Milton's Paradise Lost, and I, I, I go a little bit crazy. And, yeah. <laughs> so you can, you can just have fun as well. Okay, methods. Um, let me say a little bit about that, because people are interested in how this stuff is made. So yeah, I actually... Um, had the idea, you know, it all came together, as I said, 2006 or so, and then I, I thought, well, I really want to see if I can do this myself. So I had to see if I could really draw at the level required to um, do a 250-page um, uh, uh, book uh, that would convince you, uh, you know, of the ideas without being distracted by terrible drawings. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I had to teach myself to draw. And, and really raise the level. You know, I could, I could sort of, uh, you know, doodle and sketch like, like most people, but really there's a whole difference between that and, and getting the speed, consistency, and, and, uh, and variety that's needed to, to really pull this off. So I started teaching myself uh, that. And people go, how did you do that? And the annoying answer is, you learn to draw by drawing. And the, there's no substitute for just drawing and drawing and drawing and drawing. And doing thousands of drawings, taking every opportunity, to, every opportunity to draw, I carry a notebook with me everywhere. Uh, if I'm on the train or on the plane, I'm waiting, I will draw things, people, whatever is around me. That's practice. You learn then what, is, what it is about you that does your particular kind of drawing, and then it allows you to diagnose what you need to fix, what you need to improve, and so on, so, so on and so forth. The nonsense that there's some natural talent you have to have for drawing or even science is nonsense. It's practice. That's the key thing. So, uh, so, yeah, keep drawing, lots of drawings, uh, uh, all kinds of different methods, whether it be colored pencils or iPads or uh, pen and ink, all sorts of ways. Really learning, drawing buildings, that's a fun thing, that's really useful. And then uh, learning some of the techniques of the craft itself, uh, inking techniques, learning about light and shade, things like that. Uh, there's, there's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And then, and then Practicing and learning things about perspective and construction by hand, also digital versions of this to speed things up. It's, 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 it's very interesting. And in the end, you end up with uh, a book. Here, is, here are a couple of examples of pages um, where you can see I'm sort of doing that process where I'm, I'm, I'm sketched. This is actually a thumbnail about an inch across. Uh, that was done in a margin that eventually became the layout for what turns out to be a silent page where I'm telling the story entirely visually 
um, of a discovery this little boy makes by watching his mom cooking, uh, which leads into a, a, a very important sort of scientific uh, uh, discussions. Uh, here's, here's another page uh, in development, and then the final page on the right, and so on and so forth. So I'll skip some of that and end, because uh, I'm probably running out of time. Um, I'll end with uh, uh, one last thing. So people usually go at this point, and I'm, 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 uh, <laughs> I'm sure you're thinking, well, uh, yes, uh, so you did all of the, you took this time out of your research, and you did all of this comic stuff, and uh, has, that, has that resulted in some discovery in physics, right? And, and, and you know, I'd love to tell you some awesome story that'll be a, you know, curiosity piece on NPR or something, but no, there, there's no, no, no. Um, uh, it is enough that by learning uh, better and better ways to explain things to people, it does feed back on everything you do in your research and everything you think about. So that's important. It, one doesn't need to go, oh, I discovered this amazing thing from comics or what have you. Um, so I don't have that story, but I do, sort of tongue in cheek, do have a reply, which is that I've discovered a new equation. And the equation is comics equals physics. And this is actually a serious point. And the point is, is that you may know, uh, this is well known from studies of comics, that um, comics are not a passive medium. Very, very important thing. Um, uh, you are actively engaged in, in engaging in the convention where I look at this still, then that still, then that still. Uh, uh, you construct space and time as you, as you read a, a comic book, as you read a graphic novel. And space and time, and this is, this is the new bit, space and time, that's physics, right? So what better medium to talk about that uh, the, uh, uh, than, 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 uh, than, than, than comics? And, and the serious point is, is that if I'm trying to engage you and you are constructing space and time when you're reading the ideas, I get to play with that. And so one of the things, I, unfortunately, I realized this rather late in the game, otherwise I would have done it a lot more in the book. But, but sure, there are times when I mess with the panel structure in an interesting way. These guys are discussing the breakdown, or possible breakdown, the presumed breakdown of space and time in the very early universe. Space and time stop being the smooth, continuous thing that we think it is, and it gets lumpy in some way. So I do that with the panel structure to really resonate with that, that idea. Um, uh, space and time inside a black hole, as far as we understand from from general relativity and some other uh, approaches, they, they start doing weird things. Um, they stop making sense. So mess with the power structure. As these guys are talking about the interior of a black hole, I, I, I deliberately break the conventional order of the panel so you have a little bit of a, 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 a dissonance as you're trying to read it to figure out what order to read it. That's resonating with the idea that space and time have gotten confused inside the black hole. So there's some really interesting things you can play with in a way that I think works in no other medium this well that really makes comics a wonderful way for uh, describing the cosmos. And with that, I will end. <clears throat> How's it going? You guys don't sound very excited. I'll try it again. How's it going? All right. Not much better, but I'll take it. Well, first of all, uh, thank you to uh, Clifford and thank you to Brian and the Arthur C. Clarke Center for inviting us here today, organizing this great event for you guys. Let's give him a round of applause, please. Yeah. Brian, who I should also mention, is the author of this book, for also forgot to put up here. Yeah, applause. Um, what was I saying? Thank you to them, and thank you to you guys for coming to this event. I know it's uh, Tuesday evening. It's a beautiful night here in uh, San Diego, and I'm sure those of you who are graduate students at this hour would much rather be, you know, in the lab. <laughs> working hard, starting your day. 
Uh, but instead, you came out here to talk about the universe with us, so thank you. Uh, well, I'll just, uh, just kind of jump in right away. Uh, I'm Jorge Chao, and I'm here with Daniel Whiteson, and together we're the authors of this book called We Have No Idea. Uh, now, uh, Daniel is a professor in uh, particle physics. Uh, he works at the University of California at Irvine and at CERN in Geneva. And I am a cartoonist, and I work in my pajamas <laughs> in my garage. And so today, uh, I'll just uh, quickly say a few words about how we started working together, a cartoonist and a physicist, and then Daniel will come up here and talk about a little bit about the ideas inside the book. Uh, so I'm a cartoonist, and to me, cartooning is about taking a bl blank page and filling it with an idea. And so the idea we want to draw out for all of you here today is this idea that, that there are still big gaps in our knowledge of the universe. Now, I am a, a cartoonist, but I also happen to have a PhD in robotics. And you might be wondering, what does having a PhD in robotics have to do with being a cartoonist? Well, I can tell you that my parents were also very concerned. <laughs> about that whole career plan there. Um, but yeah, I have a PhD in robotics, and in fact, my research there focused on making small robots that could run like cockroaches. Yeah. I'm not sure why people are laughing <laughs> at my research. Uh, um, but uh, here's a quick movie of what these robots look like. Yeah, that was my, my PhD work, yeah, and I like to show this movie for two reasons. First of all, I feel like this movie really kind of captures what it feels like to get a PhD. <laughs> Some of you might know the feeling. You feel like you're running the whole time, but you're not getting anywhere. Meanwhile, there's a more intelligent being stamping you down. Um, but I also like to show the movie because it's uh, kind of the only way that anyone will look at my research. Gotcha. Uh, anymore because uh, a little bit more popular than all that uh, work that I spent on getting my PhD and doing research, a little bit more popular has been what I was doing when I should have been doing research. When I was procrastinating, which was to draw these comics called Piled Higher and Deeper, or PhD comics. Now, these are uh, comics that I started in graduate school. They were, uh, they were called PhD comics because they were kind of about the, uh, the, the, um, uh, what happens when you, uh, you're trying to get your PhD. So they were uh, mostly about the graduate students, about professors, about being in academia. Uh, there were comics about uh, what it's like to join a lab. And the begging that you have to do. Uh, there are comics about being a teaching assistant. <laughs> and having to deal with undergrads, undergrads. Uh, I'm sure those of you in the audience that are undergrads are cool. <laughs> uh, let's see, the comics were also kind of about learning the uh, etiquette of uh, graduate school. <laughs> Never ask a grad student how their research is going. That's just rude. So yeah, these were uh, just comics that I drew for the newspaper there uh, as a hobby. And then eventually I kind of took my procrastination to the next level. And I started posting all these comics on a free web server on campus. And on the ones in the newspaper, I would just put the web address in the bottom right corner. And so without any kind of real effort on my part, I think what happened was that people who would read the comics there and they liked it, they would then tell their friends that they knew in other universities, and then those people then tell uh, their cohorts and their lab mates and their friends, and then those people then tell other people in other universities, until slowly over the years, kind of like a, a virus. <laughs> These comics kind of went out into the world to the point where uh, these days about uh, five or six or seven million people a year visit the PhD Comics website to read these comics, which I know it's an incredibly small number. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, if you think about the fact that there are, there's about 7 billion people on this planet, so there's only about a 1 in 1,000 shot that any of you have heard of these comics before, uh, but it just so happened that one of these 1 in 1,000 people on the planet that saw these comics was this uh, professor, this physicist at the University of California in Irvine, who saw these comics uh, on the web and then one day decided to write me out of the blue. So one morning I just get an email from this physicist saying, hey Jorge, I've seen your comics on the internet. I think they're pretty cool. Uh, so I would like to pay you, I would like to commission you to draw some comics about the Higgs boson. And so I thought, what? <laughs> you wanna pay me? What? <laughs> I don't understand that concept. I just put things on the internet for free. Uh, but what happened was that this was a couple of years ago, back when uh, there was a lot of excitement about the, the search and the discovery of the Higgs boson. Perhaps a lot of you guys remember, there was, it, was, it was on the news a lot. Uh, and there was a, a lot of articles and a lot of people writing about the search for this Higgs boson. Uh, but Daniel didn't, uh, wasn't very satisfied with the way people were writing about it. He didn't think people were doing a very good job of explaining what it was, why they were looking for it, how they were looking for it. And so one day he just kind of decided to take the initiative and just kind of uh, take that initiative and contact the cartoonist he knew about and then offer to work with them to create something that explained what his project was trying to find. And so I thought, yeah, that sounds really cool. How much are you going to pay me? <laughs> Uh, and I thought that was really cool, and so I drove down to uh, Irvine and we uh, had a conversation at the cafeteria there for uh, a couple of hours. And instead of taking notes, I kind of uh, took my recorder and I recorded our conversation. And so then when it was time to draw the comics, I decided to experiment a little bit. I took that recording and I edited it, and then I recorded myself drawing the comics, and then I kind of mixed those two things together to create this kind of a mix of a video and a comic. And so I'm going to play for you guys here uh, just a couple of minutes of what this uh, video of this video, just to kind of give you a sense of how we started working together. Whoops. We get this. Boson is the particle that uh, is responsible for giving mass to the other particles. So even with things may have mass, means it has stuff to it. It's not actually stuff. Earlier I was saying electron has mass, but it has no volume. How can that be? Mm -hmm. it turns out mass is probably just a characteristic of a particle the way like charge is. Like some particles have charge, like electrons. Some particles don't. It's just a different kind of charge. So you can think of mass as sort of gravitational charge. And when two things have both have mass, they uh, attract each other. But interestingly, you can't have negative mass or repulsive gravity. So, right, so the collision happens. It lasts for like 10 to the negative 23 seconds, and you get one measurement, right? So if you say, well, I'm going to plot the mass, the total energy of this guy. I'm going to add this guy and this guy together and add the total energy. This is, uh, this one axis here is number of collisions. You do an individual experiment, you get one measurement, right? Here. You do another one, you get another measurement. You do another one. Eventually, you build up your data, right? and the data looks like this, for example. And then you have two theories, right, that predict the data. One says, well, I'm going to predict there's no Higgs boson, so the data should fall along this line. And the other is I'm going to predict that plus a Higgs boson. And the problem is the difference between these two theories is very small. And so the, it's very hard to distinguish these two with our data because the predicted effect is tiny, right? If the predicted effect were huge, it'd be very easy to tell the difference between with Higgs boson or not with Higgs boson. But the predicted effect is tiny, and so it's really hard to see. What you need is a huge amount of data. You need to take a bajillion collisions before you can see the difference. That's why we run this thing 40 million times a second all day, all year, to get a lot of collisions to tell small differences between theories. It's like when you take a picture of the sky. You just take a picture, you get a little bit of light. The, the longer you leave your telescope looking at the sky, the, f the more you can see farther away things. Uh, yeah, cool. So that was a video that we made, and uh, we kind of took a little bit of a risk. This was uh, uh, several years ago. Uh, now, now you see a lot of more faster things on YouTube. Um, but uh, we took a little bit, bit of a risk. We put it out there on the internet, on the on YouTube, and on the PhD Comics website. And um, initially, you know, a few hundred thousand people saw this video, which is very exciting, very cool. But then, what actually happened was that they actually discovered the Higgs boson. 
they actually discovered it. And so then this video really sort of uh, blew up a little bit. It went viral. Millions and millions of people watched the video. They read the comics. And big websites like the New York Times, CBS News, they were all pointing to this video and they were saying that this was the clearest and easiest to understand explanation of what this sort of complex and uh, difficult to understand uh, topic was. And so I thought that was pretty cool, the idea that the, um, the easiest and clearest and uh, easiest to understand explanation of what a research topic was, you know, it didn't come from uh, necessarily a science writer or a journalist at the New York Times or at CBS News or a media person. It actually came from one of the scientists who worked on the project who decided to take that initiative and create something that explained what he did to the, to the public. And so one of the things I like to do, if there are any scientists or researchers in the room, I always like to encourage you to also kind of take that initiative. Don't wait for the reporters to contact you. Just go out there and, and, and create stuff that explains what you do. Um, but that was our first collaboration together with me and Daniel. And so we've worked on a couple of other projects since then. But our latest one is this book called We Have No Idea. And so to tell you about the ideas inside of We Have No Idea is uh, Daniel Whiteson. Awesome. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. And uh, on a personal note, I have to say it's also really a pleasure to work on this project with Jorge. Um, Jorge is not just some random online cartoonist. Um, he's a rock star in academia. Wherever I go to a physics lab or a biology lab or wherever, there's always one of his drawings up on the wall, usually one making fun of professors, of course, and because uh, he's captured something about the experience of being in graduate school. And uh, so he's very well known. And so when I had this idea, let's explain physics using cartoons, I didn't have the initiative to learn to draw myself like Clifford did. I thought, oh, let me reach out to somebody who has these skills. So my wife, who's also an academic, she said, oh, why don't you email Jorge Chom and get him to do it? And I thought, yeah, right. And after that, I'll email Brad Pitt and uh, you know, maybe we can do a movie together or something, right? Um, so still waiting for that email back from Brad. But Jorge did write back, and so the lesson is sometimes cold emailing celebrities actually works. Um, so it was a pleasure to work on this project with him. And um, let me tell you about the book. It's called We Have No Idea. And there are a lot of popular science books out there that seek to explain to you what physics has learned about the universe, which is awesome, because the universe is awesome and full of crazy stuff. But that's not this book. Instead, this book is about all the things physics doesn't yet know all the open questions, all the big mysteries, the things we will in the future explore. So if you read a book from a scientist or, or a popular science book, you expect the scientist to have some authority on the topic, right? You read a book about biology or evolution, you want to hear from an eminent biologist, right? A book about the Civil War, you want to read from a, you know, esteemed historian. So if this book is about not having ideas, you might be wondering, what's my authority, right? Like, am I a professor of ignorance or something like that? <laughs> and so it's not that I have any special ability to not have ideas, but I do think I have a real passion for exploring what we don't know. Because for me, science is much more than a list of facts. It's not the things we know about the world. It's a way to learn new things. And the first step is embracing the unknown, is figuring out what don't we know and how can we get started. And for me, it really began when I was a little kid and I was learning about the age of exploration. You know, before we knew everything that this world held, you could get into a boat and sail across an ocean and you could land on a beach and be the first person to ever walk on that beach. You could pluck a fruit, right, and be the first human to ever taste that fruit. I mean, probably it was gross, but whatever, you could be the first. And I had that urge. I wanted to be the first person to know something or do something or go somewhere, right? I mean, think about the amazing firsts in human history. Like, who was the first person to see the Grand Canyon? Bam, wow, what an amazing moment. The first person to ever eat chocolate. That's a good one. The first person to eat chocolate while looking at the Grand Canyon, right? Like, these are all firsts. They count. And I desperately wanted one. I wanted to be in the forefront of human knowledge. The thing is, when you're learning about the age of explorers and all the exploration people have done, is it feels like it's kind of over, right? Like, thanks to Google Earth and satellites, we've mapped out everything. And there isn't really anything, any new beaches for us to land on. And as you walk around and learn about the world, you're amazed by what science has figured out, right? You might get the sense that science has most of things figured out because look at what we can do. I mean, we have amazing machines that take you across oceans in just a few hours. You can download all of human knowledge into a tiny device that fits into your pocket. I mean, we live in an age of wonders, right? And you might be forgiven for thinking, yeah, uh, this is as close as I get to Brad Pitt at this point right here. Come on, call me back, Brad, call me back. <laughs> Uh, 
I'm sure he's a nice guy in person, but in comics he's kind of a jerk. Um, so you might be forgiven for thinking that science has it mostly figured out, that physics has the big picture and it's just the little details we have left to, to iron out, right? That we're just tying up a few loose ends. So the point we want to make in our book and tonight is that I think exactly the opposite is true. I think actually we're at the beginning of a new age of exploration, a new era of discovery, when we're going to learn things that will totally blow our minds, reveal things about the world that will totally change the way we look at the universe and our place within it. Right? And to me, that's exhilarating. So that's why I want to focus on the discovery, on the exploration. I want to sail into the unknown because that's where the new discoveries lie. Right? All right, I'm not that old, Jorge. Okay. <laughs> this is why I'm holding the clicker. Okay, so what kind of exploration is left, right? What questions remain unanswered? Well, I think some of the biggest, fattest questions remain unanswered. And when I say a big, fat question, I mean the kind you don't need a science degree to understand the question, right? Or to want to know the answer. The kind where if you knew the answer, it might change the way you felt about life, the universe, and everything. I mean, the whole human context, right? Really big, important questions. All right, so if you ask random people, what's a big fat question? They might say something like this. Well, uh, why are we here, right? All right, that's a big one. Uh, what happens after we die? And that's a great example because say you knew, for example, exactly factually what happened after we died, right? <laughs> are there free cookies, really? I missed out. Um, say you knew what happened after we die, like actual fact, not you know, speculation or spirituality, like actually knew. That might change the way you felt about your life and how you lived it, right? And the problem with these questions, although they're important, is that they're not science questions, right? They're questions of philosophy. And sometimes I think philosophers are more interested in like talking about the question than actually answering it. You know, here's one of my favorite questions from philosophy. What is it like to be a bat? Okay, not a joke question. This is the title of the most widely cited paper in philosophy ever. Okay, you go to the halls of philosophy department here at UCSD, they are smoking banana peels and talking about what is it like to be a bat. And they may never get an answer, right? Because these questions don't necessarily have hard and fast answers, right? <laughs> Another question is, do bats smoke banana peels? We don't know. <laughs> By the way, the answer, to this, the answer to this question, what is it like to be a bat, if you haven't read the paper, is we will never know. <laughs> so I just spoiled it for you. But to me, the thing that's really exciting is that there are other questions at this same level of importance, right? Same level of, ooh, I really want to know the answer. But these are science questions. What is everything made out of? How did the universe begin? Think about that second one. The universe began in one way and in no other. There's a single true history of the universe. And if you knew it, you knew what happened at these moments of creation and immediately following, how things came together, that could very well change the way you felt about the universe and humanity's place in it, right? The way that learning that the earth is not the center of creation changed our view of ourselves completely and dramatically, right? The amazing thing is there is an answer and one day we will know it. Humanity will learn this answer by pulling out clues from the rubble of the Big Bang or something. And those people who know that answer, they will look back on us and they will wonder, what was it like to be so ignorant, right? <laughs> to not know the answer to this very basic question about our context, right? How could you live in such a world? The way we think about cavemen and cavewomen, right? Looking up at the sky, not even knowing what stars are, right? That's who we are still. We're still at primitive levels when it comes to understanding the universe. So to me, that's terribly exciting that there are big, fat questions left unanswered. Now, we can't talk about all of them. Uh, so today, let's focus on this one. This is one of my favorites because it's what I actually spend my career on trying to understand. Uh, what is the universe made out of? And to me, this is a pretty basic question. It's a pretty ancient question, right? I think it's a question people have been asking since people have been asking questions. And it's a reasonable question to want to know the answer to, right? Like, what am I made out of? What are you made out of? What is the organizing principle behind this whole ridiculous, beautiful universe that we live, live in, right? But it's kind of a big question. It's not always obvious to know how to start a big question. So you might say, well, let's just begin by, you know, looking at what's in the universe, right? So let's make a list. What's in the universe? All right. So if we're beginning in caveman times, for example, caveman, cavewoman physicist, you look around, you see like, okay, I'm in the universe. You're in the universe. There's some rocks in the universe, right? And very quickly, very quickly, he didn't even answer my call back then in the day, right? When there was only like 10 people on the planet. Um, very quickly you discover this approach is not going to work, right? And one reason it's not going to work is that your list is going to be super long, right? Because <laughs> there's a lot of rocks in the universe and a lot of kinds of rocks in the universe. But the real reason it's not going to work is that there's no insight here, right? This is like the approach of botany, right? We're just listing things, we're not getting any actual insight, okay? Um, 
Instead of that, what we want is an answer with insight. We want to peel back a layer of reality and see what's underneath. We want to explain all the complexity in our universe in terms of a simpler set of objects, right? And so the kind of answer we're looking for is a kind of answer like this. It says, I want to explain all the crazy stuff in the universe, planets and stars and galaxies and hamsters and chocolate and all that stuff. I want to explain that using a simpler set of objects. And incredibly, that's possible, right? The complexity we see in the world can be boiled down to a smaller set of pieces. And here, this is, for example, the periodic table of the elements. With only about 100 things, you can explain everything that humans have ever touched or sat on or eaten or tripped over or thrown at each other or built out of 100 basic building blocks. Almost infinite complexity boiled down to 100 objects. That's incredible. Now, you might be thinking, I thought this guy was a particle physicist. We're learning about basic high school chemistry, right? What's with that? Well, it is high school chemistry. It's also, in my view, one of the most underrated intellectual achievements in human history, right? To boil down almost infinite complexity down to 100 things, that's most of the way to, for a reductionist answer for the question of what is the universe made out of? And it makes me wonder, why is it even possible, right? Why do we live in a universe which is organized in this way? It reminds me of, you know, the Lego company. Like, this is their basic idea. With a few basic building blocks, you can make anything, right? The complexity when you play with Legos comes from how you put them together, not the objects themselves, right? I mean, you can put Legos together to make dinosaurs or pirates or, you know, dinosaur pirates or anything you want. You know, it, and it could have been different. It could have been that we lived in a universe that can't be boiled down to a few basic building blocks. It could have been we lived in a universe where everything had its own kind of particle, right? I mean, imagine, for example, if like cats were made out of their own little cat particles. That's why they're so weird or something, right? I mean, it could have been our universe. If you're starting from nothing and trying to answer this question, then you have to accept all possible ideas from the beginning, right? Fortunately, we don't live in this kind of universe where everything is made out of its own kind of thing. So particle physics is possible, right? Which, for which I am grateful. Okay, so... Um, but remember that what's, what makes up the universe is not something that's familiar to you, right? Not even the atoms of the periodic table. It's not like the, universe, the basic elements of the universe can be described using something you're familiar with, a particle or a wave or a llama or a tornado or even the combination of these things, you know, like llama tornadoes or something crazy, right? The universe is not made up out of little versions of macroscopic objects that you're familiar with. It's made out of something funky and weird and totally different from anything we've known before which is what makes it exciting. I hope that's Brad Pitt running away from that laminado. <laughs> no, no, I wish him nothing but the best, of course, please, if he calls me. Um, so where do we stand, right? We've been working on this for hundreds or thousands of years, depending if you give the Greeks any credit. Personally, I don't. Um, and where are we? Well, we have, a, instead of a periodic table of the elements, now we have a periodic table of the fundamental particles. But it serves the same purpose. It organizes our knowledge and lets us look for patterns that lead to questions. So for example, let's take a little tour. Here in this first column, we have the up quark and the down quark. These two guys combine to make the, the proton and the neutron, add the electron together, and you can make any atom. So these three things here make you and me and hamsters and llamas and Brad Pitt and everything, right? which is incredible because it means that all the stuff you've ever eaten can be made out of just three particles. So if you ask a particle physicist to write a cookbook, right, every recipe has three ingredients, right? Up quarks, down quarks, and electrons. Of course, the complexity comes in the arrangement. So these are the particles that make up most of the stuff you're familiar with. In this first column, we also put the neutrino, which is a really weird little particle. Okay, not weird because um, it's rare, it's actually everywhere. And neutrinos are flying through the air. There's 100 billion of them pass through your fingernail every second. Billion with a B, right? And the reason they don't like beat you down from the neutrino radiation is that they mostly just ignore you. A neutrino can fly through a light year's worth of lead and not even notice. So there's these really weird little particles. Now, there are also these other eight particles that we've discovered. So there's 12 in total. And the fascinating thing is we can write them in these rows because it turns out these other eight particles, they are not new different kinds of particles. They're just versions of these first four. So the charm is not a completely different particle. It's just a heavy cousin of the up quark. It's just like the up quark. It has the same spin, the same electric charge, almost the same interactions, but it has more mass. It's like the up quark has a secret fat cousin or something, right? And why does it exist? We don't know. And then the top quark is even heavier. It's extraordinarily massive. 
So the up quark has these two cousins that are like weird copies of the up quark. They're not their own kinds of particles. And the amazing thing is that all of the other particles have these two copies. So the down has the strange and the bottom. I was not on the committee to name these particles, okay? <laughs> Who wants to be a bottom physicist, right? Well, I mean, to each your own. Um, the electron has the muon and the tau, and even these neutrinos, there's three of them as well. And so they have this strange pattern, this periodicity. And here, where 100 years ago we were looking at the periodic table of the elements and wondering, what explains all this weird structure? What is it? Well, all the structure in the periodic table were just clues that explained what was going on inside the atom. The same way, we hope that the structures here and the questions we ask about it will explain what's going on inside. Currently, though, we have no idea what's going on. Um, oop, let me go back, sorry. So, for example, what questions do we have? Well, question number one is, why are there three columns of particles? To me, numbers are really important in physics. I mean, one of the stated goals of physics is to explain all the universe in terms of a single equation that you could, like, fit onto a t-shirt, right? That's how you know how it's simple enough. Imagine you had that equation, you were looking at it, and there was a seven in it. What does that mean? Well, if, the, if it's the equation of the universe, that means the universe itself is, like, seven-ish. There's something deeply 70 about the universe, right? So you have to notice these numbers and wonder why. So I look at this column, I say, this table, and I say, why three columns? What does three mean? And I ask theorists and mathematicians, what numbers would you expect in a fundamental theory of the universe? And they say, you know, one, two, pi, right? Nobody says three, unless, of course, they're Catholic, in which case, you know, of course they do. And maybe they're right, who knows, right? Um, so, but to me, it's a clue. It's the kind of thing where you look back in a hundred years and you say, oh, it was so obvious what was going on there. You know, we had all the information we needed to win a Nobel Prize right here on this slide. We just didn't know how to interpret it. So we know it's a clue. We know it means something, but we just don't know what it means. It's not enough for it to shout at us, clue, 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 right? We just, we don't know how to interpret it. Another mystery is the one about the masses. Like, we know that this column has less mass than this column, has less mass than this column, but that's about as far as the pattern goes. You know, the pattern of the way the masses increase fall on no other rhyme or rhythm. So we have no idea why some particles have a huge amount of mass and some have almost none. So there's so many questions here, so many obvious patterns that beg for a simpler understanding, that scream that there's some one more layer of reality we can peel back and reveal, but we haven't yet. And so that's one of the things we're working on. But the biggest question for answering, the, for the biggest problem for answering the question, what is the universe made out of, is that all the things we've learned about matter, everything you know about chemistry and physics and fundamental particles, only applies to a tiny little slice of the universe. Everything we've been studying for hundreds of years is only a little bit of the universe, and most of the universe is something else, something weird and mysterious that we're only just beginning to understand, right? It's like if you're supposed to study an elephant and you spend 300 years just looking at the tail, right? What conclusions can you draw? Can you generalize from the tail? It's, we just now have been walked over to the front of the elephant and said, maybe you should take a look at the rest of the elephant before making any big conclusions. And you might think, well, that's disappointing. A minute ago, I thought these guys were about to figure out the particle nature of everything, right? To me, it's not disappointing, it's exhilarating, it's exciting. This is the opportunity for discovery, right? The five-year-old in me who is sad at the end of the age of exploration thinks, ooh, look, most of the universe, totally untouched, yay. Maybe there's something cool in there for me to discover, or for you, or for your kids to discover, right? So how is it possible to know that we know only a tiny bit about the universe? And the amazing thing is, We've measured this fraction very, very well. We know this with high precision, which means we're in an era in physics called precision ignorance. We've measured very precisely how little we know about the universe. And knowing that there's other stuff out there in the universe came from some really fascinating clues. One clue came when we were looking at how galaxies spin, right? So we're in a galaxy called the Milky Way, and our star is part of it, and galaxy spin is a totally normal thing to do. But um, what we can do is something really interesting is that we can, we can think about these galaxies as sort of giant cosmic merry-go-rounds, right? And the stars are like ping-pong balls. So what happens if you spin the merry-go-round? Well, the ping-pong balls will fly out, right? So why don't the stars fly out of the galaxy? Because galaxies are spinning. Well, the answer is that there's gravity holding them in. So if gravity's holding them in, you can do something really interesting, which is you can say, I'm gonna measure how fast these galaxies are spinning, then I'm gonna add up all the stars and see, is there enough gravity to hold this thing together? And usually in science, when you do this kind of cross-check, you get a totally boring result that everything makes sense and you move on. 
But this time, they got a really weird answer. They measured how fast the galaxies were spinning, and then they added up all the stars, and there wasn't nearly enough mass in those galaxies to provide enough gravity to hold them together. But the galaxies are not throwing stars into intergalactic space and shredding themselves apart, right? Something else was in these galaxies, something new and mysterious, something invisible, to explain where this gravity was coming from. So they said, well, there has to be something in here we couldn't see. So they called it dark matter. Dark meaning invisible, matter meaning it gives us some gravity, right? This is a classic trick we do in physics. We don't understand something at all, so we give it a fancy sounding name, right? <laughs> Which really just encapsulates our ignorance, okay? And dark matter is not just the name of the theory, it's also basically everything we know about it, right? It's dark and it's matter, period. <laughs> Okay, so they said, well, there must be something else invisible inside these galaxies providing that gravity, something holding it together. Um, so let's think about what it means for dark matter to be dark, right? It means that it doesn't interact very much. Now, we know that dark matter does feel gravity because it was invented to explain the missing gravity inside these galaxies, right? So we know it feels gravity. We don't think it feels electromagnetism, otherwise we'd be able to see it, right? This is a thing responsible for giving off light or reflecting light. We're pretty sure it doesn't feel the weak force or the strong nuclear force, right? Which means the only way we've ever been able to see dark matter is just through gravity. And the problem is that gravity is really, really weak. So to see dark matter through, gra through gravity requires huge amounts of it, right? Yeah, you know, I've been friending it on Facebook for years and never got a response. It's so rude. Um, so the only way we know to interact with dark matter is through gravity. <laughs> and the amazing thing is that you didn't have to add just a little bit of dark matter to these galaxies to, to understand them. You had to have a huge amount. In fact, the amount of dark matter in these galaxies outdwarfs the amount of stars and gas and dust and what we used to call normal matter. It turns out these galaxies are mostly dark matter. What we thought was maybe a little invisible bit is the most of the stuff, right? It's like thinking most of the elephant is just the tail and then discovering, oh my God, look at this huge butt right here. You know, so it turns out we've been ignoring most of the stuff that was in those galaxies. Now you might be thinking, this is a bit suspicious. Some grad student took a measurement of galaxies, it didn't work out, so they invented a new mysterious form of matter nobody's ever seen before and is coincidentally invisible, right? <laughs> All right, it's a big claim and it took people a long time before they were gonna believe it. And the way they came to believe it is they saw other ways to detect dark matter. One of the really cool ways is through gravitational lensing. So dark matter is dark, but that means that light can pass through it. Okay, it's not black, it's invisible. And it is matter, which means it has gravity. So it can do this cool thing, it can bend space, which is what matter does, and it can cause space to act like a lens in the sky. So imagine you're here with your telescope, and there's a galaxy far, far away, and a photon shoots out from that galaxy. Dark matter can bend it towards your telescope, right? Now imagine another photon from the same galaxy shooting out another direction could also get bent towards your telescope. So now you're here on Earth, you use your telescope to look in two different directions, you see the same galaxy twice in the sky, right? Whoa, what does that mean? Well, it means either you've been smoking banana peels with the philosophers a little too much, right? Or there's some invisible blob of stuff in the sky that's distorting the galaxy, right? If you've never seen this, I totally urge you to Google gravitational lensing later because there are beautiful images out there. You can see this you know, in, the, in, the light, in, the, in the optical. It's really pretty impressive. So that convinced us that dark matter was a thing, that it really was matter, right? It had its own kind of gravity. It's not just a misunderstanding of how gravity worked. But what is dark matter, right? We still don't know. We know it's dark, we know it's matter. Well, particle physicists say, maybe it's made out of particles, right? All right, sure, that's a good first idea. But go back to the analogy of the elephant, right? Say you're that elephant scientist. You've been studying the tail for 300 years. You have elaborate theories of tails, right? Somebody introduces you to the rest of the elephant. What are you going to do first? Well, you might say, maybe the rest of the elephant's made out of tails, right? It's a ridiculous idea. You scoff at it. I just made that same suggestion in terms of dark matter, right? Maybe dark matter is made out of particles. If you extrapolate from the tiny little slice of the universe that we know into a vast fraction of the universe that's totally unexplored, you could be overreaching. I mean, maybe dark matter is made out of particles, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's made out of some new kind of matter that's not made of particles, that's infinitely divisible, right? My personal scientific fantasy is to discover something totally weird, like, oh, dark matter is completely different from anything we've ever seen before. That would be so much fun. 
But maybe dark matter is a particle. Maybe it's two particles. Maybe it's a bunch of particles, and they can interact in some new way we've never discovered. So there could be like dark physics and dark chemistry and dark biology. You know, there could even be like dark people out there for all we know. Somewhere there could be a dark physicist giving a dark lecture to a dark audience, right? Saying, we understand 95% of the universe except for this little slice, right? <laughs> That's us, you know, we're the little slice of the universe. So, so there's a lot of mysteries remaining about dark matter. So 5% of the universe stuff we know, 27% of the universe stuff we've only recently learned is some new kind of matter we don't understand. What about this other chunk of the universe? We can't say we understand what the universe is made out of if we can't explain two thirds of it. So this chunk here we call dark energy, which is science code for we have no clue what this part is, okay? And the only relationship between dark energy and dark matter is this word dark, right? They're purely by construction. Um, so how can we possibly know that two-thirds of the energy in the universe is devoted to this weird, mysterious thing we don't understand? Well, this, this discovery is, is really a wonderful story, and it came when people were trying to understand the history of the universe, and so therefore its future. So let's have a brief summary of what's happened so far in the universe. So there was the Big Bang, right? Boom, huge explosion. And then <laughs> interesting stuff happened, right? And so then people were wondering, well, what's going to happen next, you know? And people thought there's a few options. One possibility is that there's enough stuff in the universe, enough gravity from the stuff, to slow down this expansion, stop everything, and have it actually fall back in, right? To like a big crunch. The whole universe could collapse back into a small, a small dot the big crunch, but don't worry, that wouldn't happen for lots of years. Another possibility is that there isn't enough stuff to slow it down and turn it around its expansion, but just to, enough to slow it down gradually so it spreads out, continues to spread out, but slower and slower and cool off. And this is called the heat death of the universe, right? So two very unattractive options for the future. So this is option A and this is option B. People figured out a way to, to answer this question by looking back in time and saying, what kind of slope is there to this expansion? Measuring this very precisely. So they went out and they did this experiment and the universe came back and they said, no to option A, no to option B. The universe went for secret option C, okay? And I love when the universe goes for secret option C. It's like, oh, you silly humans. You don't even know what questions to ask, right? We just totally stumbled on this amazing discovery. Turns out the expansion of the universe is not slowing down quickly or slightly. It's not slowing down at all, okay? It's accelerating. The size of the universe and the rate at which things are moving away from us is increasing every year. This is totally unexpected because it doesn't require a tiny amount of energy to accelerate a galaxy of stars, right? A hundred billion stars being accelerated away from us, that's a huge amount of energy. I don't know, maybe two thirds of the energy budget of the universe, for example, right? <laughs> it's fascinating. And the thing about it is that all we know is that this is happening. We've measured this and we've measured it in several different ways, so we're confident it's happening. We just, we don't know why. We don't know what's doing this. What is making this happen? We call it dark energy to make it sound cool, right? But we really don't know anything about it. We don't have an, an, a mechanism that can explain this. I mean, theorists try to come up with explanations. Oh, maybe it's the energy of empty space. And they do the calculations and their numbers are off by 10 to the 60. Okay, so we're like, not even close to figuring this out. Which to me is exciting. It means there's some crazy discovery in the future. But also it's a bit terrifying because it means we don't really know what the future holds. I mean, dark energy is pushing these galaxies away from us faster and faster every year. And it's not just pushing them through space, it's creating new space between us and them. Faster than those photons can move through the space. It's like if Usain Bolt is running towards you really quickly, but somebody's laying track in front of him faster than he's running, he's never gonna get to you, right? So these galaxies, some of which are visible now, are gonna disappear past the edge of the observable universe. We will no longer see them, right? Which means the night sky gets darker and darker every year if dark energy continues. <laughs> now, if we predict the future, right, we don't know. This is pure speculation, not science. But if dark energy continues and even gets stronger, it could be the night sky just gets darker and darker. And eventually, it could even shred the Milky Way, right? You can imagine astronomers in 10 billion years or 5 billion years looking up at the sky. I hope we're still doing astronomy in 5 billion years, right? Um, if we survive even the next three years of this administration. <laughs> and... Um, Imagine looking up at the night sky and having it be totally dark. What could you learn about the world, right? It's amazing to, to, it's crazy to think that you could even do astronomy in that situation. All the things you wouldn't even know about the universe. 
And before you feel too good about, oh, I live now, we have stars we can look at, remember, we're 14 billion years into the universe already. What has already disappeared from our night sky never to return? Well, we have no idea and we never will, right? Those, that knowledge is just lost. Dr. Doom, what? I just saw that. All right, so here's a summary of our knowledge of the universe, okay? Most of the universe we only recently discovered is something we don't know anything about. Boom, that is humbling, okay? But it also tells you there are huge discoveries ahead of us. A huge chunk of the universe, in fact, most of the stuff in the universe, is this weird kind of stuff we call dark matter we know very little about. Okay? And the rest of the universe, that's me and that's you and that's your hamster and all the good stuff that we've been studying in science about for hundreds of years, right? <laughs> Including dark chocolate with and without nuts. That's a tiny little slice of the universe. So everything we thought was true about the universe, everything we thought was fundamental, the big generalizations we made, right, were based on the tail of the elephant over here, right? So we should really be careful. What that means is that we could potentially be on the verge of a revolution in physics, right? It could be that we learn things in the next 5, 10, 50 years that could just totally blow our minds, right? I mean, imagine reading a child's book about cosmology from the year 3000, right? Those kids will know things that would totally shock us about the universe, and they will just take them for granted, you know? It's amazing. So in our book, we try to tackle this, this topic, and we don't give answers, we just introduce you to the questions, right? What are the things physicists are thinking about? What are the possible things we might discover? We also try to tackle some other questions like, what is space? And I love these questions because you don't need to know any science to understand the question, right? This one is fascinating because you might think, oh, well, space is nothing, right? It's emptiness, it's easy, it's the backdrop. But it's not because we've learned that space can do things like it can expand, it can bend, it can even ripple if you've heard about gravitational waves. That's not nothing, right? Space is a thing. It's a physical thing with interesting dynamical properties. It's like we've been fish scientists for a thousand years just ignoring the water as irrelevant, right? And only recently realized it's quite interesting. And there are lots of other questions that we try to tackle in the book. And remember, the point is not to say science hasn't learned anything. On the contrary, it's to, to show you the bright future that we think science and physics has. Thanks very much. So now it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Diana Cowron, a fellow physicist, uh, and she is going to moderate the Q&A, or, or she's going to present her rebuttal. No, I don't think she's going to do it. She's going to moderate tonight. So Diana, take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, it was very kind of you to introduce me as a scientist. I don't do science anymore. Um, but I don't want to call myself like a former scientist, because then it sounds like I'm a flat earther or something. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> I'm a round earther, for sure. Or an obl oblate spheroid earther. That's too long to put on my Twitter profile. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start a question for you, Clifford. Um, I noticed in your presentation that you had shown your drawings and then the dates that you drew them, which started back in 2011-ish. So how long did it take you to do this whole book project and becoming a master artist? Uh, so uh, I'm far from a master artist, uh, especially sitting next to one. I <laughs> uh, um, no, no. Um, uh, uh, I, uh, uh, the, the business of um, conceiving the book, as I said, was sort of in the mid-2000s, but then I actually uh, decided, and uh, I, had a, I had a sabbatical coming up, and I decided to... I've heard of those. I, yeah, I decided to secretly uh, not, well, I didn't think it would be a good idea to tell my colleagues and my dean that I was going off to learn how to draw comics. <laughs> so I just sort of said I was going to research a book project, and I basically uh, took um, uh, a couple of months of that um, semester and just went and, and, and started hanging out in art galleries and immersing myself in the art world and just drawing everything I could see and learning about drawing and looking at drawing books and things like that. And so that started in 2010. Uh, I finished the book in 2016. Um, uh, so, but I was learning as I go along. I, it wasn't that I learned everything and then I started the book. I started doing prototypes of the stories and 
in the, in the end, uh, some of those early things got redrawn because they were really terrible, but that was how I learned. Um, so, that's, a, yeah. that's a huge undertaking. Um, and I like that tactic of putting research in front of your project, researching book project. Well, it was research. Yeah. I, I really um, spent a lot of time uh, researching the, the whole language and structure of, mm -hmm. of, of graphic novels and, and how that works so that I could employ it to do uh, uh, to communicate science, and it, it was genuine research and remains so. It's just a lot of people are still, you know, as soon as you say comic books or what have you, mm -hmm. they they just they no longer think it's serious. And Try starting you. a YouTube channel, uh, right? And so and so you you just have to choose your words carefully, even if you have tenure. I told my mom I was researching <laughs> social media. Right. right. <laughs> um, and you, and you two, I had the privilege of working with Jorge and Daniel on a video um, about cosmic rays. I wore, this is the first time I've worn this shirt. I thought it was very appropriate. Um, but you have a lot of trust between you to uh, allow Jorge to draw during your presentation. I don't think I would allow anyone to do that on my <laughs> keynote. <laughs> I have to jump in and just say that was awesome, but it was that great. Was really yeah. yeah. <laughs> very unique. You all have taken creativity to the next level with science. It's pretty amazing. Um, what happened to chapter 13? <laughs> we have no idea. <laughs> For those of you who have not the bought the book yet, you'll have to do so in order to find out what we're talking about. <laughs> Ch chapter 13, uh, yeah, it's a surprise. If you get the book, uh, you might uh, see what we're talking about, chapter 13. <laughs> <laughs> but when we were writing this book, we just had a, we found ourselves laughing a lot while writing, and so we thought, let's try to incorporate some humor into it as well, um, because we wanted people not just to learn physics, but also to be entertained. Mm -hmm. And part of what you saw on the screen there was, you know, me talking and Jorge, like, trying to distract people and entertain them. We tried to have two voices in the book as well, That's you know, great. one sort of a serious physics one and also, like, a lighter comic one, because there's only so much physics you can swallow in a minute, you know, you need a, a little bit of sugar to make the medicine go down <laughs> sometimes. But, but if you see a bad pun in the book, that was Daniel. Totally. <laughs> the good puns are his, yeah. <laughs> but it's a dialogue again, uh, in a way. Kind of, uh, kind of yeah, reads yeah. like a dialogue. Yeah, yeah you sort of get yeah. the the text, and then you sort of see yeah. what the the comics, yeah. the cartoons interpret. Oh, that's that. really yeah. fantastic. Yeah. I like it. Um, any questions? I'm not just going to keep asking questions. I'm sure you all have better ones. So, any questions from the audience here for our three impressive authors? I know you have some, so now's your chance. Right here. Oh. Yeah, yeah, you. <laughs> um, I know this question is inevitable, but what are you thinking as far as future projects go? You want to go first? Uh, go ahead. No, you go first. All right. <laughs> <laughs> We're thinking a balloon in the Macy's Thanksgiving Parade. Yeah. <laughs> the shape of With the Higgs boson. <laughs> <laughs> just take one of those M&Ms. I was going to say, call me Brad Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, we have a couple of cool projects that we like to tell people about. Uh, one of them is a podcast. Mm -hmm. So we're teaming up with the people at Host How Stuff Works. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. And then uh, we're putting out a podcast. It's called, very humbly, Daniel and Jorge Explain the Universe. <laughs> the whole universe. <laughs> the whole universe. <laughs> and so it's just us kind of having this kind of dialogue where we talk about these uh, topics and these big questions about the universe. Uh, and then we're also kind of working on a TV show, an animated uh, TV show. Yeah. Hmm. That's great. Yeah. And some physics also. <laughs> you still do physics? I still do <laughs> In my spare time. Um, I, I'm still trying to decide what, what exactly to do next. Um, an obvious thing, which uh, people have responded very well to the book, and an obvious thing is, is a volume two. Um, there's probably uh, outlined um, at least half of that already. Uh, I, I, you know, when I was uh, originally structuring the book, um, I ended up with probably material for about 400 pages. And then at some point um, in that last six months, I, I, just, I, you know, I sort of took uh, a path through that material to carve out something that would make a nice book with, with sort of nice callbacks and things like that. And so there's a lot of stuff that's on the cutting room floor, as it were, which could be worked up into a volume two. Um, I'm not sure, however, that um, I want to dive into something that, you know, in principle could take another six 
years working on. Well, you've so, already put the work in to uh, learn how to be yeah, an artist. Yeah, but so so so. But Did it, you get a sabbatical every six years. Yeah, but I, I get it it's every seven years actually. It doesn't um, last six uh, years though. But it doesn't last six years. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, so uh, one possibility is to maybe do some smaller projects um, first, uh, which, which still combine uh, drawing uh, with, with, um, with science in various ways that have a quicker turnaround. Um, and, then, uh, and, then maybe, uh, and then maybe go back to the larger project. And, and uh, you know, although I was sort of, it sounded like I was dumping on, on prose books, I, 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 you know, I love those too, and I may, I may write something. But then there's sort of other things uh, of that nature. But I, I just think this business of being very visual and really using visuals in a, in a way that is just not employed very much still is something I really want to keep pushing on, and I'm, I'm glad to have colleagues in the field who get that and, and uh, are, are doing that too. I, I, I really think that you know, if, if, if we do this right and, if, and it's supported by, by readers, um, it will change the whole landscape of, of what books look like, um, which I think is for the better. So no pressure, but everybody has to buy a copy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a question down here in the front. Yes. <laughs> Who did I? Oh, thank you for saying I have a sense of humor. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. You were all funny. I enjoyed the whole thing, the whole show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, it was just, um, you know, I, uh, one of the big sources I always say is that I come from Panama. I grew up in Panama, and uh, everybody's funny in Panama. <laughs> so I'm, I'm actually like the unfunny one there. <laughs> There's just a, it's a humor is a big part of the culture there. Uh, I hope you get a chance to travel there someday. But it, it, yeah, it's just a culture where it, there's a lot of humor, uh, a lot of sort of looking at the lighter side of things, even if they're uh, if they're bad news and things like that. <laughs> and so yeah, I, th I would say the culture helped me a lot. And then I just kind of got a, had an interest in it, and so I would pay attention to things like comedies and and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there was a question over here somewhere. Yes. Uh, well, thank you for helping the graphic medium become a little bit more legitimate. Like uh, do you guys still encounter a lot of stigma for, for comics and things in academia? I know you've already commented on it a little bit, but are there specific instances where you come up against a colleague who you know, kind of uh, turns up their nose a little bit? Yeah, I'm curious about that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just is there, a, do you come up against uh, colleagues that push back against your doing outreach and doing this kind of artistic endeavor versus just devoting all your time to science is, I assume, kind of what you're asking. Is, yeah. Yeah, has anyone really kind of uh, looked down on you for, for uh, pursuing this kind of mm -hmm. uh, Well, luckily these guys have tenure, so. <laughs> I don't think they care. <laughs> yeah, if only we that was simple. We have tenure, yes, uh, but we still are dependent upon our colleagues and their esteemed opinions uh, for our funding sources. So on a serious note is that, um, yeah, it can affect you if, uh, if people um, don't think you're you know, serious enough to send uh, you know, precious resources your way because they think you're wasting your time and things like that. I, I, get, I get a double whammy on that, or perhaps more than double, because I also spend a lot of time uh, as a science advisor uh, for um, movies and, and, and TV. So you, get, you also get a lot of people who think you're just goofing off with your Hollywood buddies <laughs> and, and trying to explain that you can make a huge difference to people's perception of science and scientists by dropping a tiny bit of science into a, you know, you know, multi-million dollar movie. Uh, I, I have some comments on the physics of the Avengers, though. Maybe we can talk <laughs> later. I think I think one of the one of the one of the problems is that, uh, especially in our fields, I think uh, there are a lot of people who really only value things that they can measure. And one of the hard things about outreach is that it's very hard to know exactly what effect um, a, a single thing you do uh, can, uh, can, can have. Um, I happen to think that it's, 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 it's positive and can be huge, but uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to put that, you know, put a graph in a, in a grant proposal or stuff like that. So there are a lot of people who dismiss it because they can't measure it. 
which sort of fits a lot with the, you know, um, what, uh, you know, sort of the business about the unknown versus the known. Um, so that can mean that uh, there are there are problems of perception and things like that. But I think mostly what what's happened is that the people who like what you do tell you they like what you do, and then there's this vast silence <laughs> from the rest. And it may be because they aren't aware of it, or it may be because they uh, don't think very highly of it. You don't know. And uh, you can either spend a lot of time worrying about it, or you could just continue doing what you think is something positive and valuable. So I choose the latter. I get a lot of positive support from my colleagues who say, you know, thanks for doing something to explain our field, or they finally had something to give that relative who didn't understand what they were doing in their work. Uh, so th that's been really positive. Uh, something I encounter a lot is as we travel around, I see colleagues that I know from my work, and they say to me, oh, are you going to get back to doing research sometime? Um, <laughs> because they assume that you can't do this and research simultaneously. Um, and so I have to combat that a little bit. But I don't think that's a, a negative feeling on their part. They're just assuming that you, know, that you um, can't do both. And so trying to re-educate them one at a time. I think that's about all we have time for. Um, let's hear a round of applause for our three authors. I'm going to pass it back to Brian. Thank you, Diana, and thanks to all the participants. So we want to leave some room and some energy for them to sign their names a hundred times. So thank the panel, thank Diana, thank Patrick Coleman for setting everything up, and the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination for uh, setting up tonight's wonderful event. Stay tuned for more great events. Thank you. Thank you.